Well, I think you summed up the budget pretty well. I mean, it is an extraordinary amount of money for an extraordinary year. I mean, we knew the numbers were going to be uh, colossal, and they were. The big question, I guess, is, is it being effectively directed? The most important reflections that I have on this budget are that they have abandoned some of those ideas that have been haunting the political sphere in Australia for, for so long. And I think that it's important not to whack them too much for uh, inconsistency, but instead to give credit where it's due and to say this was this was a day for an enormous budget and that that's, that's what they've delivered. But, you know, if, if this budget was um, a sculpture, it'd be like an enormous glass sphere. It's very big, it's very heavy, but Gee, that doesn't look like a lot of thought went into it. It's, uh, it, it. It lacks intricacy. The sheer scale of the tax cuts and the scale of the employment programs designed to try and subsidise people to get back into work, I think is really intended both with a, with a political and with, a, with an economic framework to, to get the economy going and get people grateful for Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg and eager to re-elect them. Uh, but on that, Bernard, uh, yes, it might be aimed at them, but... For anyone who's going to be on the old $40 a day, needed social housing, childcare, believes in climate change, anyone in the arts, they're hardly winning them over, are they? Or are we just, it's the usual ideological, we won't worry about them, we're not going to get their vote anyway. Oh, very much so. I mean, the losers from this budget is a list of the people that the coalition doesn't like. Australia was already in a big productivity hole coming into this pandemic recession. Our labour product, productivity actually went backwards. I'm not sure that these sort of measures are going to do anything to restore that. That's not a short-term priority, I know, but over the longer term, we're looking at population falling over the next couple of years or, or, uh, or you know, much, much lower. <laughs> Apologies for that. That's the, that's the, that's the feline contribution. Um, we're looking at, much lower, um, looking at much lower population growth. We're looking at relatively poor productivity growth and this employment, you know, the big surge in unemployment in recent months has really done some damage to our participation. They're the three P's of economic growth in Australia and the stage is not set for strong results in any of those over the medium term. People aren't going to get out and start behaving normally in an economic sense unless they have some sort of confidence they're not going to get infected. So, you know, the virus is kind of in charge of our overall level of, of, of economic activity to an extent that creates a lot of uncertainty. And that's particularly the case uh, in big markets like the US, which is, you know, obviously has played such a crucial role in the global economy. So even if it doesn't directly affect us, it's going to indirectly affect us through our big trading partners like China. Yeah, I'm worried about the kind of headlines that we could see in late winter coming out of the, uh, the big markets in the Northern Hemisphere. If they get a, a big second wave before the hope of a vaccine is, is realistic, then I think uh, stock markets will come down and uh, the capacity of people to go into additional lockdowns. I'm in Victoria. Let me tell you, pandemic f fatigue is real. It could be, could be quite ugly, um, if, especially if places like uh, New York and London see big second waves. Uh, great, great big budget. Well, a big budget, but maybe not a great budget. Let's put it that way. Well, that's as succinct as we can get. Um, Bernard? Um, I'm worried we're going to borrow a trillion dollars and we're going to come out of this in the mid-2020s with an economy that looks much like the economy of 2019, and that wasn't flash. Can um, I say, Bernard, you'll hate this, but you're sounding a bit like your name is the AFR editorial headline today, <laughs> shock and awe, or spending with no real chance of change. I've got, I've got to say, I, was, I found myself surprisingly <laughs> nodding in agreement. and I, I thought you would. <laughs> I never do that when I, when I look through the AFR site, but that's actually the issue that's behind a lot of the yep. scepticism. You know, what are we getting for all this? And I'll just have a final say. We didn't get to it, but I'm interested now what the states will do. Uh, they're going to lose a lot of GST revenue. Will they pick up the slack, particularly social housing? That's something where um, New South Wales and other governments can do it. So that's going to be interesting on that. It's the, the gaps. Will they fill in some of those gaps? Um, look, the burning question really that's coming through is what is the name of Bernard's cat? Yes. I would. Well, uh, can I reveal there are in fact two cats? Uh, oh, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, um, the, the boy's name is uh, Monty and the girl's name is Daisy. They are siblings. So and is that Monty uh, or Daisy I can see over your shoulder right now? Um, uh, or do they look Daisy. the same? That would be, be Daisy. 